my role is to be one of the special envoys for the World Health Organization on uh, COVID-19. I'm joined by five others and our job is to help amplify the guidance given by the World Health Organization, to interpret that guidance and to accompany people in society and in leadership positions as they're interpreting that guidance and then to feed back on what I see and hear to the leadership of the World Health Organization and other international organizations. I've been doing this work now for some weeks, started at, very, at a very light level in January, but obviously as the outbreak has been advancing, so my work has intensified. I'm a medical doctor and I used to work on other diseases, particularly avian influenza and also Ebola and cholera. And I have some experience, therefore, of tackling outbreaks, particularly in a coordination role. This is the first time that we've decided to have a, an open briefing. And that's because we found that the various things that we're learning, which we've been sharing through narratives on websites, have proved to be of interest to colleagues. And they've said, we'd quite like to have a, an oral briefing and a chance to ask a few questions. And that's why we're doing this. We'll see how it goes. We'll also see whether or not the platform that we're using with the numbers of people who might want to speak and also whether or not you as the participants that this is a helpful way to be engaging. Uh, the technique that we're using is that we like you, if you want to ask any questions, to put them into the chat section of this Zoom platform. We have people organized in our team who are going through any questions or comments you put in the chat section, and then they're feeding them to us. And then during the briefing, we will try to address as many of them as possible. I'm not sure how easily we'll be able to follow up afterwards, but we'll do our best. The whole purpose really is to share what we know with you, but also to give you a chance to share what you think with us. As far as this feedback thing. It does help a lot if you can keep your, your system on mute. Of course, don't hesitate to contact us through other channels if you feel that there are aspects of the way we're presenting that could be more useful, or you, if you have any concerns about what we're saying. I'd like to focus on the, on the disease itself. This is a, a respiratory illness caused by a coronavirus. There aren't many coronaviruses known, but one of them is, has been around and is with us a lot, and that is the one that causes the common cold. There are other coronaviruses, like the one that emerged in 2003, that caused severe acute respiratory syndrome in Southeast Asia. And, and by and large, what we know about coronaviruses is that they are quite stable, they don't change a lot. Uh, they are highly transmissible, and uh, they're diseases that they cause diseases that, as they emerge, uh, are ones that we don't know much. About. So we've not had a coronavirus pandemic before. We've had pandemics of influenza, for example, but they're different. And coronavirus has to be treated as a unique illness and has to be treated with respect because we're learning about it all the time. And there are things that we don't know about the disease, uh, and we are learning as well, which is why we're seeing that many th of those who are involved in the response have to change their response strategies quite regularly as they get new information. That can be confusing. And one of the reasons why we wanted to start this kind of conversation was simply because there are shifts happening at, at all the time, and we thought that it might be useful to share our understanding of the shifts with you. Let's talk about the disease. Some of you have probably already had the coronavirus, you won, and without really knowing about it. But let's go back to the, to the beginning when it appeared as a cluster of people with an unusual pneumonia uh, in Wuhan in China. And then there was a, 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 an, a, an expectation that we would find the source of that disease. And the current view is that it jumped from animals to humans. 
And this is actually the way in which most new infections appear. They jump from the animal kingdom into the human race. And that appears to have happened late December, early December last year. And it quickly built up as, a, as an outbreak that was a concern to the Chinese authorities in Wuhan city and then in Hubei province. And after some uncertainty, the, the Chinese authorities realized that this was very serious and they implemented a, a strong response, uh, which during January and early February really built up. And we saw how over time it was possible for this outbreak to be brought under control. So let's think a bit about how an outbreak like this happens. What, say somebody with coronavirus comes into a community, what happens? Well, they'll give it to others, and that will then form what becomes a chain of transmission of different people infecting other people. And a chains of transmission then turn into clusters of cases. We call them cases, people with disease, and I hope you don't mind me using that word. You have clusters of cases, and then again, over a bit of time, it turns into what we call community transmission. And when community transmission becomes widespread, we, we do have what we call an explosive outbreak. But why does this all happen so quickly? The answer is because this coronavirus, one person having it, can move to three other people. And that's a really a recipe for something that moves very rapidly. We believe that out of every 100 people who get the coronavirus, 80 of them become uh, mildly ill and only 20 of them become really ill. And of those, only a small proportion then go on perhaps to get very severely ill and die. Usually those who die are older people and people with other diseases, but that's not universal. And we're seeing some reports of younger people getting really ill as well. So as the cases expand from being a chain to a cluster and then to a small, small uh, 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 community of transmission, we describe that as an outbreak. And this coronavirus pandemic is really lots and lots of outbreaks happening all over the place. Some just starting, some chains, some clusters, and some bigger community transmission uh, instances. And the way in which we respond to that kind of outbreak is by trying to contain it when it's happening and trying to stop people transmitting the disease one to the other. And you'll hear me during this briefing talking about interrupting chains of transmission. And that is the absolute center of how we contain outbreaks and then suppress them, always trying to interrupt the transmission so that eventually there's not lots of people getting infected. But of course, what this means is that if we don't interrupt the transmission and the tra transmission goes on, then rather quickly, what we have is a big outbreak. And I want to talk to you a bit about the dynamics of that because it's so important to understanding this disease. We'll take an individual outbreak. So, uh, a, a few people start getting infected after an, an individual has arrived in a community. And um, uh, basically, it, one person can get lead to eight people being infected after a week, 40 people being infected after two weeks, and then it can go on several hundred being infected after three weeks, and then perhaps a thousand people in, being infected after four weeks. The, the number of people in an outbreak can double every two and a half days. And that's fast. Because what it means is that you can actually get from one person to a thousand people infected in a month. But then if you see it on a much larger scale, doubling every two and a half days, it means that you very quickly get from a few cases to a big outbreak. And that's what's been happening in some parts of the world, that you've seen these outbreaks develop very, very rapidly. But it also means that if you act quickly, when an initial person has the disease in a community and you stop them from infecting other people, then the outbreaks can be quickly contained and then suppressed. And that's the, really, that's the basis of how you control a coronavirus. You interrupt the transmission, 
interrupt the transmission as quickly as possible. Of course, if something is accelerating really rapidly, like I've described, then catching up with it so that you get ahead of it and can get it under control is quite difficult. And sometimes what has to happen is that societies try to jump ahead of the outbreak in order to really get the transmission under control. And one way of doing that is to try to stop people from having a chance to be together with others and to transmit the disease to each other. It's what's called reducing opportunities for transmission. Now, this disease is a respiratory disease and it affects the lungs. And what happens is you get infection coming into the upper part of the uh, respiratory system, the top part of your lungs, tubes go down into the parts of your lungs where air is actually being uh, uh, exchanged and you're getting uh, oxygen coming into the body and carbon dioxide coming out. But the real challenge happens because the disease causes inflammation in the upper part of the lungs and you get quite a lot of virus in the upper part of the lungs. And that virus then gets transmitted from one person to another through droplets inside breathing or talking. You, most of us, like I'm doing now, we let out droplets from our mouths when we're talking. But droplets come out mostly when we cough, we sneeze, and the droplets can travel, you know, up to a meter or a meter and a bit from our mouths. And so in order to try to prevent yourself from being infected, you really have to be two meters away from another person. So in order to reduce opportunities for transmission, you like to get people to be more than two meters apart from each other. And that means that, that quite often in order to jump an outbreak, the countries try to introduce wide scale physical distancing. Physical distancing means making sure that people are more than two meters away from each other. And in order to do that physical distancing, you can introduce restrictions on what people do and how they do it, particularly trying to reduce the opportunities for them to be close to each other. And that can be done by asking people to stop meeting together in small gatherings or large gatherings, and really to respect the physical distancing rules. And of course, in order to try to maintain the physical distancing rules, sometimes you have to be a bit more stringent and say, well, actually, we're going to reduce the opportunities for physical distancing by banning meetings of a particular size, or even by asking people to stay at home, what's called lockdown. But that's all trying to reduce opportunities for transmission so that it becomes easier then to, to, to interrupt the transmission through the process of uh, identifying people who are ill and separating them from others. So you can say, well, can't we just cure this disease? Isn't there some nice cure that we can get? Answer, there is no cure known at the moment that can reliably stop people uh, from being ill as a result of this coronavirus. There, is no cure. there are certain drugs that have been talked about as possible cures and they're being investigated, but as of now, we don't have a definite we will go on getting research, trying to come up with ideas, and that's what we have to deal with. Now, I want to go through a little bit how different countries have approached the challenge of interrupting transmission and then introducing physical distancing, and to talk a little bit about what that means. And I thought the best way to do this is to take the example of China, which was the country where the disease first arose, and to talk about the Chinese experience. This has been examined by the World Health Organization. The team are doing a 10-day visit to all different parts of China, including Wuhan, and talking to the scientists and others, talking to communities, and finding out a bit about what China did at the beginning and what China's doing now in order to help us. Now, some of that Chinese experience has been followed by other countries, including South Korea, including Singapore, and uh, we can draw on that experience from other countries as well. And I thought that also I could bring in some examples from countries in Europe that are being affected and so on. And I'll, in, while I'm doing this, I'll also be telling you a bit about the spread of the outbreaks and the shape of what we now call the COVID pandemic that's affecting the world. 
So starting with the Chinese example first, there are four things that I uh, take from the Chinese experience. And by the way, if you want to see it, the Chinese report uh, prepared by the joint WHO China team is on the website of the World Health Organization. It's super easy to find. And it's www.who.int, which is a fabulous source and reference guidance and the one that I use all the time. I particularly use the daily briefings by the Director General of the WHO, Dr. Tedros. The four lessons from China. Number one, the people were solidly engaged in the effort to try to tackle this disease. I want to stress the people were engaged. It was the state that did it. The state helped, as I'll explain, but it was people themselves that were involved and that realized that they were dealing with a major threat and they knew what they had to do. Number two, inside every community, there has been well-functioning public health services. Now, these public health services, to explain what they are, they are people who know about disease and who know what the spread of disease involves. They were able to keep an eye on all of those in their communities. They were able to identify those who were well and who were ill, to identify those who needed support and who didn't. They knew that older people tend to be more likely to get ill as a result of this disease, and they were looking out for the older people. And they acted as community sentinels, just basically checking out what was going on in their communities. And they did it and do it very efficiently. So the second part of what China did was to have strong community-based public health services. And what did they do? Answer, if somebody felt ill, they contact their community public health people and they say, I don't feel well. And the community public health people arranged for them to get tested if the testing was available so that they would know whether or not they had COVID. And then once they'd been diagnosed, then had the disease, they were absolutely told to stay isolated, ideally two meters away from everybody else if that was possible. And at the same time as identifying them, they also would, con would identify their contacts that they'd been with since they'd been ill. But because in this disease, the virus tends to spread most easily in the early days of the infection, when you're chase tracing, tracing the contacts, you look for people with whom a person has been in contact for two days before they got ill, because it looks as though they actually secrete virus in the days preceding ill, two days, as I said, and then subsequently, while they were ill, in order that the contacts could be identified and they in turn could be put in quarantine, kept under surveillance, and if they got ill, they too could be again isolated and their contacts identified. It sounds like a very painstaking job, and it is, but if you've got enough people working at community level as public health professionals supported by volunteers, acting as sentinels and support people, then you can interrupt transmission. But it's a much easier thing to do, find an outbreak in its earliest stages. The third thing that we got from China was that they really looked at their hospital services because there is, as I said, 20% of those with COVID, when they get ill need hospital care and the hospital care has to be good it has to be able to look after the breathing. It has to be able to support the basic life systems. And that hospital care, if it's done proficiently, can save lives. And the Chinese example is brilliant because they were able to develop very good protocols management. They rewrote them six times during the period of three weeks. And those protocols managed to bring down the death rate of people with COVID illness to less than in Wuhan and in other parts of China. But if you have to run hospitals so that they can deal with people with COVID, as I think everybody knows, we have to make sure that health workers are protected because they're the most important people in this fight. Without the health workers, we can't do it. And for the health workers protected so that they don't get ill, they have to have special protective equipment that enables them to look after people who've got virus uh, and are secreting virus and coughing it and so on, without it then affecting them. 
Unfortunately, not all health workers have been able to be 100% uh, successful, and we've got quite a lot of health workers in the world who are now affected by COVID, partly because they get super tired and exhausted when they're doing their work, often working long shifts, and the droplets somehow get in between the, the gaps in their protective clothing, and that makes them ill, or they may get infected in their own communities. This is a really important thing, and I need to keep stressing the protecting health workers in hospitals is vital. Also in hospitals, you've got to make sure that you've got the right equipment in order to ensure that people with respiratory problems can be looked after. And I think you've gathered probably from some of the reports that this is quite uh, equipment like ventilators and oxygen supplies and so on. So making sure you've got hospitals with staff that are protected and with the equipment is key. And you sometimes have to take some hospitals and make them special COVID hospitals so that other hospitals can keep running largely without people with COVID so that people with conditions that are not COVID but are still life threatening can get treated because the last thing you want is for the health system to for COVID. So number three in the Chinese experience was looking after the hospitals and number four in the Chinese experience was making sure that the whole of local government and central government was there to provide backup to the health systems and to give them the assistance they needed. Now, because uh, the experience in parts of China was very high intensity of transmission, China also had to introduce very quickly physical distancing measures, which did include requiring people to stay at home and just being in contact with each other uh, with the physical distancing re regimes. And that included in some places lockdown. The lockdown is super useful to reduce intensity, but also what the Chinese realized was that it's no good having lockdown without the basic community-based public health in place, because when you release the lockdown and get people coming back to normal activity, you've still got to be able to identify those with disease quickly and interrupt chains of transmission, because there's always the possibility, even if you reduce the COVID in your own community, of other cases coming in. So that capacity to keep on the alert with a high index of suspicion is there. I want to just say that if you haven't got testing, it's quite difficult to interrupt chains of transmission, but it's not impossible. And in many parts of the world, we have transmission of COVID going on and we haven't got testing available. So here, if you've got symptoms of COVID, particularly the fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath and chest pain that was preceded by two days of illness, perhaps associated with a rather odd sensation of losing your sense of smell and taste, assume you have COVID. And even if it's only mild and you're not sure, assume you have COVID. And you might have it mildly, but you've got it mildly, but if you then go and see your family relative, they may not get it mildly, they might get it severely, and they might get really ill. So do please try to make sure that as you're doing this work, are uh, all the time maintaining a high index of suspicion. You're all the time, if you've got the symptoms, isolating yourself. You're not just looking after your, your immediate relatives, but you're also protecting others by not roaming around and seeing them. And because you can be anxious even before you've got symptoms, I, and, or when you've got very mild symptoms, I do ask everybody to be super careful just simply going about your normal life and saying, well, it doesn't really matter. It might be fine for you, but it might not be fine for the person you might infect who might not be somebody you know, and they might end up going on and, and getting super, and that's the last thing you want. So I gave you these four Chinese example, these four things from the Chinese example. People involved, community health service working well, hospitals super organized with health workers protected, properly supplied, and that's all health workers, cleaners and porters, as well as nurses and doctors. And then fourthly, government supporting it so that it works. And this government support's important, making sure that food is still there and that people can buy food, making sure that medicines is still there and people can get medicines, making sure that the water supply stays good, making sure that there is transport, particularly so that health workers can get to work, making sure that Health workers can get their children after in creches if the schools are all shut. All these things are things that local government and national government has to prioritize 
when you have a COVID outbreak. And I like to stress that if, if governments are going to do this, they have to work seamlessly. We have some instances where central government takes one position, local government takes another position, and the community leaders take another position, and they're all slightly at variance with each other. That's understandable because when we've got an exponential phenomenon, trying to keep up with it means that we do have to jump ahead of it. And jumping ahead of it only really works if we all jump together. And it's a fairly difficult thing to do to keep everybody on the same page and working seamlessly, especially if there are pre-existing disputes of a political or institutional kind. So I'm saying to everybody, this is a time when inside governments and between governments, all political differences have to be put aside. How it is to score points. We have to stay absolutely focused on one epic struggle, one common enemy, which is the COVID virus. I said I'd talk a bit now about the shape of the pandemic, just a few words. Started in China, moved to other countries in Southeast Asia, moved on to Iran and to Italy and to uh, other countries, but got established in Iran and Italy uh, earlier this month, and then moved to Spain, to France, and then to other parts of Europe, and then into the United States, now being transmitted quite widely in Europe and the United States. We don't know exactly where the virus is, because widespread testing has not been done, not at least in these countries. And now it's going quite rapidly into other parts of the world. It's in Africa, in many countries. It's in Latin America. It's in the Middle East. It's in uh, Central Asia. It's in India. And it's also in other parts of the world that are perhaps e e even more isolated. It's got into some islands in the Pacific, into islands in the Caribbean. Just about the only continent that apparently is not touched is Antarctica. It's everywhere and the virus is moving. And my strong request to every government every, is to prioritize the process of interrupting transmission. Make sure that public health services are good. Ensure that communities are properly organized so that they can be ready to contain, sorry, to contain and suppress as a result of interrupting transmission. Introducing physical distancing through shutdowns and lockdowns, please do so in a way that pays attention to the fact that these are very damaging to people's well-being. They, people who are on daily wages and who don't know from one day to the next how much they're going to get because they're having to juggle between different sources of employment, they're the ones who are most at risk. Small and medium enterprises that have very limited room for manoeuvre, they're at risk. Larger companies that can perhaps withstand are doing better, but we've seen that some large companies that are in businesses which are immediately affected by the actions taken to reduce COVID infection, they're suffering. For example, airlines, hotels and tourism, a lot of... As a result of all this, there are many people who are feeling extreme, extreme difficulty, real struggle. They're very anxious about where their next income is going to come from. They're worried about how they're going to feed their children. They're finding that when they go to the shops that prices are rising and that they can't get the food they want. They're very worried about the future. I think we all have to understand that the actions being taken to encourage physical distancing can cause huge hardship. So that means that we have to try to make sure that the actions that are taken for physical distancing, particularly lockdowns, as they're called, are kept as short as possible. People say to me, well, is it a choice between a lockdown and public health? I say, no. I say the lockdown is done to introduce physical distancing, to try to reduce the intensity of an outbreak. But at the same time, while the lockdown is happening, you must do everything you can to build up public health capacity, including testing if you can possibly do it, in order to ensure that when people do have the disease, they can quickly know they've got the disease and either isolate themselves or be isolated. And then when you've got that public health capacity in place and strong, then you can gradually reduce the lockdown and then not have to reintroduce more lockdowns later because of a rebound and an intensification of disease. Because this virus isn't suddenly going to go away. It seems to be remarkably stable. It's going to go on traveling around the world and it's going to be a long time before we have a vaccine that we can possibly offer to people everywhere so that they can reduce their risk of infection. Vaccine is probably 18 months away. 
And even when a vaccine does appear, there are going to be challenges in making sure that those who most need it can get it. So we have to keep going with this capacity to interrupt chains of transmission in the community through a high index of suspicion, through testing and through uh, public health actors there, uh, if we possibly can. We have to be remembering all the time that it's rapid response to outbreaks that, matter, that is most important, not doing it slowly. My last words now. I do think that this is a global crisis. It's something bigger than anything I've ever experienced in my professional life. It's affecting health, and I'm sure that there are increasing numbers of people who are really very sad because they're losing loved ones to this disease. There are many more who are sad because so much of their life is being disturbed. And there are people who are very worried about the future, about whether they're going to be able to have their businesses or whether they're going to have employment. It's something on which everybody has to play a role. Everybody has to lead. I think people in business have a vital role to play, if they possibly can, through their employees, through their communications with the public, and through their interactions with leaders. They've got to do everything possible to keep supply chains going. And yet, at the same time, they're struggling with borders being closed all over the place, with suppliers not being able to come up with the supplies they want. And, there are areas where I think there's big worries, like the areas like food or like energy, as I said earlier on. So people have to be taking responsibility themselves. Communities have to be organized as much as they can through local leaders, through setting up sentinels, perhaps one person for 50 households to keep an eye on them. Business have to, businesses have to do what they can to keep supplies going. Local authorities talking to mayors and others in in communities near here, they're telling me that they've got an enormously important role to try to keep society together. And then governments, of course, have a huge responsibility. And governments working together so that they are dealing with this issue as a global crisis as one. Well. And that brings to huge responsibilities on leaders like the Director General of the World Health Organization, who's working tirelessly to remind us all of what's involved, as well as the Secretary General of the United Nations and other national leaders who really are now being called upon to lead for the world. But it starts with us. This, as Ted Ross keeps saying, is the first time we've ever had a coronavirus pandemic. And it's the only pandemic of coronavirus that we've started to try to understand and get on top of. And the thing that we've learned the most is it's a pandemic that we as humans have the capacity to fight back, to beat back. We can do it through our actions, through our responsibility, through the way we care for others. Do it through the way in which we support our health workers. We can do it through the way in which we support each other through what's going to be a very tough time. We know that if we can get the basic public health functions working in communities, then lockdowns are not so necessary. The economies can restart. We've seen that in China happening now. We see it in Singapore. We see it in South Korea. We see it in Japan. It's not something that's going to go on forever, but it will be a new reality when we've moved through this pandemic and when we've reached a point where we are confident that when new outbreaks start, we can surround them, we can contain them, we can suppress them in ways that treat people with dignity, with their human rights being properly uh, re respected. We can do this ourselves, and that's why I am wanting, as so many of my colleagues who are special envoys in the WHO system are trying to do, we want to connect with people and remind them that it's up to them. We produce narratives that are available that our colleagues will make sure that on the chat line, you can see where the narratives are available if you haven't seen them. And the narratives are to show how community solidarity responses can be at the heart of this. They're gonna be so important in poorer countries where you don't have strong government necessarily, you don't have services, you don't have testing kits, but by organizing ourselves at the community level, we can interrupt transmission by having a high index of suspicion. When we've got coughs, when we've got fevers, when we've got shortness of breath, that means we've got COVID and we have to keep out of other people's way for 14 days until the disease is gone. Now, I may have forgotten one or two things because I was trying to look at the camera while I was talking and I wasn't always checking my I've got some questions here 
So what can people listening to this briefing do right now? Get informed. Make sure you know everything that you possibly can. Bear in mind that there are lots of people writing lots of things on social media, in newspapers. There's lots of controversy and criticism. Why wasn't this done? Why wasn't that done? All over the place. What you need to do is to get the basics. And the basics are there on the World Health Organization website. And we interpret the basics in our narratives, but they're being interpreted elsewhere. Nothing I write should be at variance with what the WHO advises, because I'm a WHO special envoy. Please take that on board, share it with everybody. Because as I said, this is all about us. Number two, your, the WHO and my personal perspective on the misinformation circulating, and how do I address it? I wish there was a simple, a colleague of mine, Richard Edelman, he runs a company called Edelman's, which is a big uh, public relations outfit, and they do uh, polling, opinion polling, and they asked people all over the world recently, where do people get information from and do they trust it? Trusted information they found comes from specialists who've got the scientific training and know what they're talking about when they talk through official media like national broadcast channels or respected newspapers. Most people look at social media, but they say they fundamentally distrust an awful lot of what they read in social media. There is a massive recognition that there is a lot of misinformation. Of course, there'll be conspiracy theorists who believe what's in social media. There always will be. But most people say, don't get your information from social media unless it's retweeted from a reliable source. Use what Dr. Tedros of WHO says in his daily briefings. Use what's on the website and really concentrate on that. And if you have questions or uncertainties, you can share them with me or you can share them with others. We do our best to try to interpret. Use also your national government websites. They tend to be accurate and they're helpful. So what are the projected impacts on food security? particularly in Africa and Southeast Asia. One of the reasons why people are worried about food is because of stockpiling of what's available in retail sources. And of course, whenever you get a, a crisis, there's always stockpiling. It's natural and rational behavior. I ever want to say to people, you shouldn't be stockpiling if you use it, toilet paper or other, other such things. That's normal. It gives you a sense that you're in control. And we all want that. And so I'm not objecting to it, but we have to recognize that obviously if we if we are stockpiling, other people are stockpiling as well. Who are they? Well, there are people inside the food distribution chains who are stockpiling. There are governments who are stockpiling food. Some of them are even stopping exports of food from their countries. And so that does mean that it is absolutely inevitable that food supply chains are going to be damaged and depend a lot on the capacity of those who've got stocks, particularly governments, to help deal with shortages when they occur. I'd like to suggest that in the light of this, we all need to be considering as we eat, are there ways in which we can ourselves and our communities be being as self-reliant as possible on our food? And are there ways in which we can do everything possible not to waste food. So because, as you probably know, 30% of all food is wasted and perishable foods, the wastage rate is 40 or 50%. No food should go wasted at this time. It's too precious. We should all recognize that when there is stockpiling, those who are poorer or weaker tend to do less well. So we've got to be looking out for older people and poorer people who are getting into difficulty. I know already of homeless people who depend on food banks, unable to get food from their usual sources because they've closed down because of the COVID outbreak. So we should be looking out for people who are being affected by breakdowns in food systems even now and protecting them. And we need to do everything we can to be ready for it because I do think there will be food challenges. I don't know how bad they're going to be, but I also think that we learned in 2008 that you've got to be absolutely in advance of this. And our colleagues 
in the rest of, in the United Nations system and working on this with great energy on testing when someone is tested for COVID, what are the basis on how this works is there more than one kind of test thank you this is a very important point I'm not a total expert on these things I as you probably realized deal more in the bigger aspects not bigger and that's wrong term in the aspects of global coordination on these kinds of issues but what I've learned is that the primary test that we're using at the moment looks for the virus. The virus is a small piece of ribonucleic acid, and you need to take samples from people, and then you basically amplify what sample that you've got, and then you do a thing called a PCR, a special kind of analytical work that then tells you whether or not the coronavirus 19 is actually present inside a sample from the person. Usually it's a swab taken from the back of the nose, sticking a swab up the nose doesn't feel so nice. Sometimes it's a swab in the throat. And basically you take that swab and you subject it to the PCR. It usually takes a bit of time, 24 hours to get a response, depending on where you are. There are some automated tests coming that give a result a little bit quicker. But that is the fundamental thing, is testing for the virus itself. And remember I told you, that the virus is there a lot just before the illness, at the beginning of the illness, at the beginning of the illness, immediately after. But then there's another kind of test that's important. They're not yet widely available. Some of them are on the market. You can buy them on the internet. I'm not sure how reliable they are, but the new reliable ones will come. They are testing for the antibody, which is the chem the molecules that your own body produces to try to gather, gather around the virus when it's in your body and neutralize it. So it's your own reaction to the virus. And the advantage of antibody tests is they can also tell you somebody who's had the infection but had it very mildly, who's what we call asymptomatic. Antibody tests are coming on stream. You sometimes, those of you in Britain, you hear the British chief medical officer often say we need a serological test to understand what COVID is doing in our communities. That's the antibody test. And just at the moment, we're on the cusp of having reliable antibody tests. And they are useful because, as I said, they tell you what's going on in the community, but they tend only to, to convert and you get a positive result after uh, some days of having the disease. And, and that means that you can't use them right at the beginning. Now. I've got a question about international response. By the way, I'm talking fast only because I want to try to do as much as possible during the hour, but all my friends tell me that if I talk fast, it's harder to follow me because I get into a sort of hyper state. So I'm slowing down because Florence on my left is saying be a bit slower, so I will, uh, but it's not. I'm not doing it for any other reason than just I think I communicate better if I talk slower. So what are the international responses to help congested urban centers, Manila, Jakarta, and so on, where health systems might be under significant strain? And I think the question I added, and I want to really give an emphasis to this, places where there are a lot of refugees, and I would also add places where there are conflict, because the coronavirus is now in many big cities that do not have well-organized health services, where people are living very close together. And I learned when I was dealing uh, as with others, there are others on this call, with the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, that transmission inside urban development where people are living very close together is particularly hard to deal with. So the international responses to work with congested areas, particularly in poor countries, are really, really ramping up but they're not magic. It's a difficult one because you still have to try to interrupt chains of transmission. But those of us who worked in cities with infectious diseases know that that gets hard if people are living in very small, either dwellings or shacks, where a lot of people are crowded together. They're very close together in the community. This two meters isolation gets very difficult. And we are well aware that this is a massive, add one other thing, that we're saying that in order to try to 
reduce the risk of infection, you must wash your hands often, you must cough into your elbow, and if you're using a tissue, you must throw that tissue away. Well, many of us who've worked in very overcrowded settlements in poor places know that there's no water for hand washing, there's no soap to wash your hands with, you can't wash your hands with soap and water and sing happy birthday twice, as some people are doing, when you haven't got any you can't blow your nose into a tissue if you haven't got any tissues. Yes, you can possibly cough into the crook of your elbow, but it gets difficult. And if you are ill, it's very hard, to, as I said, to get the, so the, the physical distancing in place. So we are asking communities in these crowded areas to work out for themselves, using the basic principles of what we know about tr interrupting transmission, to try when there is COVID, within a part of their city to do everything possible to try to get it, uh, get the, uh, I, the um, physical separation in place. And um, if you can do that, and if you can try to follow the principles that I'm talking about, you stand a chance of reducing the speed with which with, with, with infection transmits. I'm really concerned. I, I, you are about places where there are a lot of refugees gathered together. I won't name any of them, but you know where they are, because there are real challenges there, especially due to limitations of health services and health. But that's where local organisation is absolutely key. I'm particularly worried about warfare. We have found that the Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo has been super hard to tackle using uh, the procedures of interrupting transmission. I don't like to use the term, I am worried if I can't do anything about it. And so I'm working very hard with colleagues across the whole of the international system to try to make sure do, we do what we can to empower those living in these crowded communities to use whatever sentinel systems they have to try to make sure that at least there is the, we're building on the resilience and the organization within local communities so that they can take this on board. You know, we did find that in dealing with Ebola, when communities took responsibility, even in quite crowded, what one, one might call uh, slum communities, though I hate that term, that they were able to actually get organized and to really take their own control of the situation to try to interrupt transmission. That is so important. What is PPE? Why do we keep hearing there is a shortage of it? Health workers, as I mentioned, depend on special clothing in order to prevent themselves from getting infected. Sometimes when you see a television documentary about coronavirus or about Ebola, the thing they show is humans wearing rather peculiar gear, which looks like they've come out of a science fiction movie with a hood over the head, a big screen over their eyes, mask over their face, and then a, a very big apron over their whole body, gloves on their hands. They, uh, this is what's called personal protective equipment, and it protects the health worker or other individual from being infected with a virus. It's really important, really important. It can save lives many, many, many times over. But we need it, and we need it for health workers all over the world, and there is a shortage. The shortage is because a lot of people have been buying it because they're worried and they need it for their hospital workers, so they're buying it for a very good reason. Nobody else wears PPE, it's hot, you don't like it, uh, and you sweat a lot underneath it, so we know why it's being bought. But obviously, there is a limited supply in the world, and if suddenly everybody buys it and tries to build up a stock, then there's a shortage on the markets and the, the, the term being used to describe the PPE situation, a bit like the mask situation, is there is market failure. And so the various companies that are involved in this work are now meeting in a platform organized by the World Economic Forum to try to deal with this market failure and create a much more rational supply of these things. I'm shortening my answers. What is being done? to keep essential supply chains open nationally and internationally. This is where governments really are focusing. I am told that this will be an issue in the meeting of the G20, one of the big 
uh, intergovernmental groups tomorrow. It's something that's on everybody's minds. Businesses are working on it. And I'm glad today that businesses everywhere are meeting now in various different places about supply chains. There is a problem with border closures. Every time a border is closed, that creates all sorts of problems with supply chains. So we're appealing always to governments to at least keep the borders open for essential medical supplies, essential food supplies, and anything else that's essential for people's lives. What are the key roles of various UN agencies and coordinating mechanisms? Well, I can tell you is that the UN has a crisis management team made up of the head of the major UN agencies that is meeting regularly every day or two days under the leadership of the Secretary General and the Deputy Secretary General. They've divided the work between themselves, but they're also integrating across. They're looking at all aspects of this. Health, of course, but finance, communication, human rights, issues around children, the disabled, and uh, all the finance and economic stuff. And that is being looked at very, very intensively. Is it well enough integrated? I think it is, because it's not just at the headquarters level, by video conference, of course, it's also the UN has 130 resident coordinators with country teams who are doing exactly the same. I think on this issue, I've never seen UN coordination working so strenuously and effectively. What can governments do to help facilitate the moving of supplies around to factories, hospitals, patients who need the answer, facilitate it? I think this is a true area where governments need to get, uh, get involved. Short pause between questions. What specifically would you like to see business do? I wrote a note about this, uh, what, which was narrative number, stopping thinking, number three. And there's another narrative, I think it's number six. These, uh, six or seven. These narratives stress that business needs to be involved in everything. Sharing information through any advertising you do. Talk about what individuals need to do for their own protection and hygiene on the wrappers of your goods. Put it into your advertisements. Don't make the entire advertisement about the pizza you're selling or whatever else, but make sure that you use that advertising time also for communication. There are very good infomercials now coming available from film stars or football stars. There's a great WHO campaign on safe pair of hands involving goalkeepers that's around. Just broadcast this stuff everywhere. Don't give up. Make sure that you use your business communications to point everybody to the World Health Organization's guidance. Make sure your staff are contributing to community organization because they can support such good work. And you don't have to do it by making a fuss. You just turn up and you offer to help. You've got several countries now appealing for volunteers and you can do the volunteering safely. There's plenty of good ways to protect yourself when you are volunteering in your community. Businesses can work together to keep vital supply chains going. They can work together as LVH have done to repurpose their manufacturing to make money. Or they can be like other companies are doing to prepare masses of sanitizer. Businesses connect with suppliers, connect with employees, connect with the public. Businesses are trusted, according to Edelman's, especially when they're working with government. Businesses are important because they view the medium to long term. They're not worried about short term issues. They're worried about 10 years, 20 years. And I think all of us believe that business has an enormously important role to play in helping us through this. With regard to healthy, have we invested enough in our health systems? Might this teach us for the future? I think that after we've got through the acute phase of the pandemic and stabilized to a point where we're better able to defend ourselves, we will do so much better in terms of understanding what kind of basic health facilities we need. I think what we're learning now is how dependent we are as humanity on our health systems. We always knew, we always knew, ever since I started my professional work, but particularly since I started working on bird flu in 2005, we always knew that one day there would be a pandemic. We used to say we don't know when it will come, but we know it will come. 
And there were pandemics that we weathered, like the H1N1 flu pandemic of 2009. And then we had the big Ebola outbreak in South Africa, 2014, 2015. And we knew that that had the capacity to spread all over Africa and beyond. It wasn't very infectious, fortunately, but wonderfully, the communities in West Africa, supported by all sorts of national bravery and international audacity, that Ebola outbreak was brought under control. It took a year and a half, and the end was very bumpy. And still, we've got Ebola in other places. We know that these kinds of outbreaks can happen because there are always viruses and other pathogens ready to come into the human race, jumping usually from animals, but they could come from other sources. And we know we need defense. And the defense doesn't mean any fancy, fancy stuff. It's all very basic of making sure we're on the alert and we have people at community level who can do it. And the best people do it always in conjunction with their local populations. They don't try to come in and boss them wearing uniform or anything like that. They're just there alongside people and working with them. And if, we, if, if we'd been in, for example, in Central Africa at this time, and we'd be talking to them about coronavirus, they'd say, look, we're dealing with tuberculosis, we're dealing with HIV, we're dealing with Ebola, we're dealing with all sorts of other problems all the time. We know about what community organization and resilience is. We know about getting ourselves organized. We know about how to do this. And perhaps this is a time where we need to say to ourselves, we need to understand that health and health services is fundamentally about a relationship between people and those who offer support to them so that they can be stronger and live better lives. And perhaps, perhaps this will lead to a really radical difference in the relationship between people and those who support them, people and their governments. And that in turn will lead to governments also understanding that for people to be healthy and well, they need good food, they need water, they need sanitation. And it really will help us to just get a better understanding of just what real life is all about. And then there's one other thing. This is an existential crisis. And um, somebody's written just now saying, what do we need? to do to slow the spread of this virus. Uh, and I'm saying, yes, as you've said in your question, it's about working together. You know, some people think that the best way we deal with a problem is to simply come into a smaller and smaller circle and say, this is us, and we're just going to do things for ourselves, and we're basically going to not worry about other people because we want to look after ourselves first and foremost. Well, for some things that might be right. I can't think of many. But the one thing I've learned about health and disease is that this is something that involves all of us. If it's a communicable disease, it most definitely does because the agents of communicable diseases don't respect borders. They don't respect boundaries around our village or our town or our, or our country. And in fact, what we learn about these things is there is an enormous symbiosis between the human race and other parts of nature, the kingdom, the plant community, fungi, and uh, every other living system. So perhaps it is important that we learn two vital things as we're going through this. One is that there's no substitute for us really being good at working together. It's not do-gooding, it's the future. It's the only way in which we can tackle the future. And secondly, that we need to recognize that we are living systems ourselves, our bodies are living systems, and the rest of the world is full of life and living systems. And we have to learn to integrate and respect and value these living systems because they are us. And while we're going about it, let's recognize that addressing this particular existential crisis involves all of us in an epic struggle that we can only tackle by working together by little actions that we take individually but when you add them up to everybody it's a ginormous ginormous 
action to shift the systems and take us, take us forward. Because we've got other crises. We've got a huge loss of biodiversity. We've got rapidly accelerating climate change. We've got massive inequity, huge pressures for migration, for people who are having a miserable time just trying to somewhere where they can have better lives. And that needs everybody working together. Leaders at the top, of course, but all of us in communities, yes. But not ever saying that we're better to work with strife and with disagreement and with enmity, we have to learn to work with those we don't like, because all of us have to do it together. So I thank you for many, many great questions. I thank you all for joining. The number of questions, the quality of your questions, the extent of your interest shows me and my colleagues in 4SD something that we've always truly believed. Collectively, we have the power. It's in our hands. Just got to do it. We're going to look ahead. We'll try and do this again if it turns out that it's not okay. Thank you for inspiring us. We're now fixing a time. We're going for Friday, 9.30 European. We'll try again. We'll review what we've done today. Meanwhile, thank you. Bless you. Bless you very much. Drive on.